I remember the first time I drove a Bugatti. I just got pins and needles. And I went cold. The bass is enough to shake any building. My name is Lordaly. I started off making content around cars. I was 17 years old. Nobody was really doing what I was doing at that time. And for some reason, people loved it. Nothing happened overnight. This is 18 years of sleepless nights, blood, sweat, and tears, and the client comes first. And that's the recipe that we use now with Platinum Executive Travel. It's not sometimes the passion, it's the person you share that passion with. Uh, so in my case, it was my father. It was just cars, cars, cars. My father and I always constantly talked about cars. But where do you go from a Bugatti Chiron? Well, I asked myself the same question, and then I found myself buying a boat. And not quite any boat. It's a yacht. <laughs> <laughs> Aleem, I think any automotive fan, and we just discussed this, in their 20s right now, when they see you, it actually may bring back what life was like for them growing up because YouTube had a lot less players in it and we used to soak up and enjoy and watch your content. And what's nice for me is sitting here in the van is I get to look back and think of all those videos that I enjoyed, but I can relate to them because I saw them when the cars were on the drive at home, when you were um, doing videos with the only other players that were around, you know, the likes of Schmidt, the likes of Yanni. It was you guys that are in the game and you're a big part of me falling in love with cars when I was growing up. So I have a perspective of you. The audience, the guys that already know who you are that will be here, have a perspective upon you. But what I want to know is, Aleem, who are you and what do you do? Right, my name is Aleem Iqbal and uh, I call myself Lord Aleem online. Uh, I started off with making uh, content around cars um, when I got kicked out of school. <laughs> so I had a lot of cars on my driveway. My father had a, a car rental company. And I just started making a lot of content with these cars, which I guess put me where I am today. Uh, really connected with people online, as you can understand. Guys love cars, and there is a huge car community. Nobody was really doing what I was doing at that time. Uh, it was quite new to the scene. I was 17 years old, pushing a Lamborghini Aventador around a park whilst reviewing it. Uh, with the dodgiest camera you could ever imagine. And for some reason, people loved it. Um, and I guess uh, it was the start to many magical things. I think people loved it because back then, people were getting an eye into a world that they didn't see. Now, with everything relating to content online, it's about how you can make a bit of content stand out or be different to stand a chance of it being seen versus someone else. Back then, you were just giving people a bit of content to view that wasn't out there. People didn't have that look in because YouTube was such a new thing. Or well, certainly that's how I kind of view it. And since then, and over that period, you've built up well over 400,000 subscribers on YouTube, which has helped push the business that is sat behind us in this glorious building in Birmingham. And you've also built up well over 800,000 plus followers online as well, and a huge network of the people within that that are actually meaningful. Loads of memories, loads of experiences, loads of moments over that journey you'll be able to think back to and tell us about. But the one that really matters to me, and the one that I want to understand is what is the earliest memory of you realizing what life was like with the family business, with the rental business? And it all come in very real and true to you. This is what we do. And it all kind of makes sense to me. What was that first okay. memory? Well, my father's always loved cars. Um, he always used to have a Ferrari or two, um, a Porsche whenever he's growing up, whether he'd buy that with his friends, two or three of them go three ways on a car and just get to enjoy it. Or, or he, he, you know, towards, you know, 2005, 2006, he managed to have his own one as well. Um, and I remember it was school. I'd come back from school and uh, my father was, uh, I, I hasn't come back from school yet. My father had gone to the Rolls Royce dealership in Birmingham which is now closed down. It's, it was sitting at a BMW. There's a gentleman there called John Carts. He's worked for Rolls-Royce for over 35 years. And uh, my dad walked in there and wanted to buy a Rolls-Royce Phantom. And uh, the deal was taking hours and hours to close. Maybe like he was in there for about an hour and a half. They were having a great crack and uh, trying to get the price down. But it was time to pick me up from school. So my dad had to put an intermission into the deal and say, look, I'll come back. I've just got to pick my son up from school and uh, just sharpen your pencil a little bit and see what you can do with these numbers and I'll be back. He thought he'll never come back. He's only gone and picked me up from school. He's brought me back. 
And he's gone, we're going to the Rolls Royce dealership. We're buying a Rolls Royce. I says, do you what? He says, yeah, I'm selling the Ferrari and we're going to buy a Rolls Royce. I'm going to do a chauffeuring company, start a chauffeuring company. I was still quite young then. I says, oh, I'm not quite sure. Rolls Royce. Little did I know, it was a quarter of a million pounds. This is like, at this time, it was enough to buy a house with this sort of money. You know, we've not really seen money like this going into one car. It was a big ass deal. Yeah. Gone to the Rolls Royce dealership and he's, he's, he's cracked on with the deal a bit more. They've shook hands, they've agreed a price and now it's time to spec up the car. But my dad's been in the dealership for so long and he's a man who, once the deal's done, couldn't give a shit about everything else after that. He's like, John, you spec it how you think would be good for me. He goes, no, 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 Mr. Bell, can't do that. It's a quarter of a million pound car. There's loads of different colors, loads of different interiors, loads of different vibes. You tell me what you want. Well, I was like, oh, I'm confused. I don't know what I want. He's gone, look, I've got a demo, a, another car that's going to a customer in the Isle of Man, and it's upstairs. Would you like to have a look at that? We've gone upstairs, 30 seconds. My dad's had a look at the car. He's gone, just copy this. Just replicate it. And now I'm asking my dad, what are we doing with this car? because I don't want to sell the Ferrari. The Ferrari's my pride and joy. Like, you take me to school in it, you pick me up from it, everyone loses their nut. What's this Rolls Royce? He said to me, this is the king. This is the king of the road. And we're going to make money from it. We're going to just start a business. He got the idea from the Dorchester Hotel. I've mentioned this on many podcasts before. They had a, a car outside their, their, their uh, hotel, and they were renting it out for a bit. So he got the idea from that. Anyway, he's bought that. And now, when I saw the Ferrari leave, and it was sold... There was tears coming down my face. I was like, no, the Ferrari 360. No. It's in the memories that I've had with that. Dad, we can't let that go. Can we keep that as well? He said, unfortunately, to have the things that you want in future, you've got to let go of the things that you want now. So this is just another thing. He goes, don't get attached to these things. There's just a bit of metal. He goes, it will come again and it will come tenfold. Oh, don't trust you, Dad. No, please don't sell the Ferrari. No, no, not the Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> off it goes onto the truck then comes to the Rolls Royce I'm like whoa this roll is a bit of a beast it's getting seeing the car I'm thinking okay cool then I started seeing customers coming through obviously uh, we had our first few clients started doing photo shoots with the car uh, started to launch the business then uh, in uh, obviously when the business was operating after 12 months purchased a, uh, a Lamborghini Gallardo, Gallardo Gallardo, whatever you want to call it, Spider, and I was like, whoa! That was the first car I ever remember driving that was super duper. Yeah. Like a dream car experiences day on track. LP540. And I looked like a little lesbian drama teacher. <laughs> <laughs> 12 years old, blue Gallardo Spider, hair round here. Coupe. In a, no, it was Spider. 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 Manual or eager? All I remember, it was eager. All I remember is they had to get several pieces of foam because I was so short just to put on the seat <laughs> to prop me up so I could see over the wheel. But what a car. What a was. car. Do you want to win a car completely for free? Of course you do, right? Well, previous guest of the podcast, Calvin's Car Diary, runs Planet of Dreams where they give away a car every Friday totally for free. Literally, all you have to do is follow Planet of Dreams and Calvin's Car Diary on Instagram and subscribe to Calvin's Car Diary on YouTube. The craziest part is when Calvin came on this podcast last year, a winner actually found out he'd won the car by Calvin mentioning on the podcast he couldn't get hold of the guy. It turned out the guy was listening to that very podcast and ended up going and picking up his Hyundai i30N at the end of the week. So what have you got to lose? It's literally three taps on your phone, automotive content that you will love, and the chance of winning a car every single week for free. Best of luck. Back to the episode. Well, I mean, that for me was just like the most magical moment because we went from for loving Ferraris all our life to now finally a Lamborghini being on the driveway and I was all over it like a rash. And then I was like, well, what's this? Is my baby? It's like, no, you've, we're going to rent this out to clients. My heart just sank. I was like, you what? So we're going to give this car to someone for a fraction of the price of what the car's worth and they're going to go out of sight and they can do whatever they want with the car and we're just going to be sitting at home waiting for the car to go, I couldn't do it. I was only young, but obviously my father's always raised me with respect. He always takes on board because he knows, you know, he's going to be taking over the business in the future. He knows it's a, it's a learning curve for him as a process. So over the years, to answer your question, when did it hit you that this is the job you're in and you've got to be bulletproof and this is what makes you different from everyone else is basically when it came to the point where I didn't start worshipping 
or valuing or seeing the cars as cars, as just metal and as just a money spinner. Something where it's just purely a business. I've got to take my emotions out of this. Doesn't matter whether it's a brand new Lamborghini done 10 miles on the clock. The keys have to go to the client when the client hires it. And that's the recipe that we use now with Platinum Executive Travel with over 38 cars. Um, with some of the most prestigious cars would it be a Lamborghini Aventador, or SVJ, a Revuelto, a Bugatti Chiron, a Mercedes G-Wagon, a Rolls-Royce Cullinan, a Lamborghini Urus, Bentley Bentayga, Bentley Flying Spur, you name it, whatever car it is, zero emotions, and the client comes first, because that's when the money's up. So do you still get that same buzz out of cars, though? Oh, yes. Like, Even I mean, though in, you've removed the remote emotion out of them. Yeah, I mean, I guess I get pride and I enjoy building my fleet for my clients. So when I know my clients have a greater, a wider, um, a, a, a broader uh, palette of options, uh, be it even be the same car like a Lamborghini Huracan Evo, but in four different colors, that's what gives me a buzz now. Not so much the fact that I've got four Lamborghinis in four different colors. It's like, what will my client feel when he walks into a showroom and says, I want to hire a car. Not only does he get to choose the make and the model, but he also gets to choose the color and the interior color. What did you do for work experience? Oh, that's a very good question. And I actually have an email I can dig out as proof as well. So uh, when I say proof, it's just the feedback I got from uh, the work experience. Um, well, there's only one place I could do work experience. And that was Rolls Royce. <laughs> okay. So I pulled the favor off from uh, John Carts. Uh, for, uh, my father emailed John Carter and said, Liam needs to do some work experience. Is it okay if we can do it at Rolls-Royce? He said, well, I'll do one better. You can do three days at Rolls-Royce. You can do three days. Or was I think it was two days at McLaren. So, okay, fantastic, wherever. Uh, went to Rolls-Royce and John Carts didn't at one moment treat me like as if I was a teen on work experience. He threw me straight into the deep end. God is my witness. On my work experience, I sold a green Rolls-Royce ghost on my work experience, on my life. And did that give you the high that you needed to be like, I just want to be involved with these cars. This is what I want to do. Because what I'm interested and fascinated about is sometimes when you grow up in that environment of what your family wants you to do necessarily, no doubt your dad would have really wanted in the back of his head a lean to grow up and take over the business. And that, that would have probably been his dream from an outsider looking in. That doesn't always happen. I had a good friend... Um, called Benji when I was at school. Fantastic tennis player. I always thought he's going to go on to be a tennis player. And just one day, just lost his love of tennis. It was just gone. Because you can almost overdo something too much. Was that ever a doubt or question in your mind that this is where you'd end up? Never, ever, ever. Like, you can see baby pictures of mine from when I was, like, a toddler. Uh, two, one and a half, two, three years old. And my mum's got pictures of me in my little Jeep that my dad bought for me. I've got posters in the back, R34 Skylines, Ferrari Testarossas, um, you know, Porsche Carreras. Uh, growing up as well, all my toys were car models. It was just cars, cars, cars. My father and I always constantly talked about cars, magazines, cars, uh, what's on the telly, cars. Cars. You know, I felt sorry for my mother and my sister at one point because all that was going on uh, was cars, cars, cars. And um, I never, ever, ever felt that the love of cars uh, dropped. If anything, it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Oh, Christ, that's, that's a little bit of a worry because what I've already lost on them over the years is worrying enough, let alone where it could go in the future. So I better make a few I tell you what points. does. I tell you what does sometimes kill the passion uh, for anything is if the person that you... Uh, we're sharing that passion with is no longer here. That's what really kind of extinguishes that flame a little bit. I've got a friend of mine uh, who was really into cars all his life, German fella, um, really into cars, got a great fleet of cars, Novitech Ferraris, Rolls Royce Dawns, G-Wagon, 4 by 4 squares, you name it, the lot, into racing, the lot. And, you know, when his father passed away, it was very difficult for him to kind of find that uh, flame of, of of getting passionate about cars again. Uh, when I tried talking to him about, oh, bro, have you seen the 812 El Lago Ferrari or, or, or this? Because I know he likes his Novitech Ferraris. And I just didn't see that spark in him anymore. Um, so I realized after that, it's not sometimes the passion that excites you. It's the person you share that passion with that really gets you going. Uh, so in my case, um, it was my father. Um, so, you know, he keeps me going. Every, anytime my motivation drops or whatever, he picks that buzz up again. And um, I'm pretty sure it was the same for yourself or... Yeah, 100%. Um, 
But something that I went through from working with my father growing up in a family business, which is what makes me feel comfortable enough to kind of ask these questions, because I feel like I would have related to stuff that you must have gone through as a kid growing up. I was a fan of lots of content creators online, but there was a few that no matter when I watched their content and tried to enjoy it, eat because we're in such a minority... And what I mean by that... You're is, a minority! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Wait! <laughs> oh, no, I'm just going to get in the cell now. Um, kids with cards that are really well dealt, very lucky positions that they've got opportunity and experience in front of them. Everyone's first association is wealth. They've got wealth, they've got money, they've got... Because of that, they've got opportunity. I think it's the other way around. They've got experience, they've got someone to teach them, and that's absolutely invaluable, especially if you're yes, close sir. to that person. Very lucky that both of us fell into a family business. Family businesses are great. There was loads of family businesses across the UK. But you hear all kinds of stories and different stories coming out of family businesses and kids that have grown up in family businesses. Some creators online used to, when I was growing up, make sly, horrid comments about the fact if they'd come from nothing, which many people have done, that is fantastic, you know, well done, it's commendable. Yeah. But there's also several people across the UK that have come from something and ended up with nothing. Mm -hmm. And there's several that have come from something and made that something even better and taken it to the next level. That's and there's why some there's that have been hating from day one and it's now day 100 and they're still in the same position that they're in. So my point is, did you ever struggle like I did when you were growing up through that business? And did any of those comments ever get to you? What was school like when you were being picked up in a Rolls Royce or Ferrari? Did you, anything ever get to you, the other kids, the comments, the stuff you must have experienced? Or was you like bulletproof through all of that? I was literally bulletproof throughout all of that. My mother would always tell me I'm someone special. She goes, you're special, God loves you. And that's why you're in the position that you're in. But just remain humble, be grateful. Doesn't mean that you speak disrespectfully towards people. Um, let your character also represent how God has gifted you with so much. So it was instead of going around and I've got a Rolls Royce, it was more like, hey, I've got two more seats in this Rolls Royce. Would somebody like to come with me? Like, you know, to, like, if it's the rugby pitches down the road, my chauffeur will come and pick me up. And it's like a, a five kilometer drive. I'll have two seats there and some of my friends are walking or someone, I'll be like, do you guys want to jump in? Or even when I used to, like, uh, when I had prom as well, I had five Rolls Royces, I only, I only needed one, but I had four behind me that were empty. And I just let anyone from my school that wanted to go in it sit in it as well so i mean for me it's always been one of those things right where um it's these comments have never really got to me i've always had a very strong character alhamdulillah um and i truly believe you should want you should want for others what you want for yourself at the end of the day you know um having that spirit within you has got me so far you know i've, I've not really experienced jealousy or hate or never really been envious of anyone. And I, and I think about that all the time when people say he's jealous or whatever, and so-and-so is jealous. I have to remind myself what jealousy feels like. You know, I, if somebody pulls up in a Coinings Egg Jesco now outside, I'm not gonna feel je jealous at all. I'm gonna be buzzing. So I'm gonna be like, wow. Saying, right? Yeah, can, can, I, can I have a look at it? Ask him what, who he is, what he does. And times move on. But those people that have had that kind of spite in them from young, who would point fingers and say, oh, he's part of a family business, he's got everything on a plate, he doesn't have to do anything. I don't want to mention any names, but I look back at him now, and I'm like, well, where are you with everything? And look where I am with everything. Like you said, we get dealt the cards, and we can't complain about those cards, because that's the cards that we got dealt with. But it's how we play them is what sets us apart. And some people have played their family business cards very, very poorly. And they've given it large, and some of us have played it very, very well. But time is a healer time shows the true colors from within everybody and you know it's less talk more action as some people would say you know um you've just got to you've just got to take it with a pinch of salt this has happened from time from the day the world started you know till till now people will always be here to spectate and comment and say this is what you should do this is what you shouldn't do this is what he's like he'll never make it but let's just use all of this as fuel to really ignite that flame inside of you and be like, you know what? Not only am I going to do it for them, but I'm going to do it for my family and I'm going to do it for myself because I am not going to bow down to these assholes that said you're going to be a waste man. Because I'm, I'm not. I know what I'm. A, what I know what I can achieve. You know what you can achieve, Ben. Right? 
And sometimes what holds us back is that drive and that energy that some of these bastards suck out of us. Because you do get upset. We're human at the end of the day. But the quicker you get rid of these comments, the quicker you put them in one ear and out the other, and you just focus on the goal and task in hand, slowly but surely, these negative comments will turn into positives, and you'll remember. They'll think that you forgot what they said, but you'll remember. And the reason that I ask is because I do remember. I remember watching your content. I remember watching the videos. I remember some parts of your journey from an outsider looking in. And one of the things I remember is, did you spend some time at London in uni at university? Yes, I did. Yes. So I remember that part of your life because it was actually the part that we got to stop looking in so much because you started to slow down very, with uh, the videos, yeah. with the vlogs, with the consistency. And the reason that I asked my previous question is because I was wondering if there was some sort of correlation there. Why did you stop doing the video? Why did you start doing the video? Okay. Did those comments ever get to you, the people that were saying that? It doesn't sound like it. You sound like a hard, tough bastard. <laughs> but, <laughs> but did... If I'm honest with you, um, Ben, it was... Uh, it's, you know what? You're very analytic and you've analysed something there, but it wasn't what you think it is. It was more so that I've lived in Birmingham all my life. All I had here was cars, the gym and home right and as soon as i've gone into the big capital right the big london i've got a lamborghini aventador sv roadster i'm 23 years old i've got the most amazing apartment i've now connecting and meeting people at uni whose dads are billionaires that are pulling up to school in porsche 918s right sls fab editions like my car park was just full of the most exotic cars you'll ever imagine and i was like hold on a second there is live past YouTube. Like, are these guys YouTubers? Is this why they have these cars? You know, I was I was a bit, I didn't know the world like I did. Get to know them, get to find out their family businesses, see what they're doing. Oh, we've got a party happening here tonight. Oh, we've got a dinner happening here tonight. And before you know it, you've got no time for YouTube. You're networking with the big fish. And it's like, okay, I need to, like YouTube's not my priority right now. I don't need to, this is a moment to live within the moment. I did do a little bit of YouTube. I did like some videos of me driving around the SV, giving, having some fun and all that sort of stuff. But where YouTube started to fall off a little bit for me when, was when I actually started to see that this is more attention than I could really handle. And in public. I know I've only got like 480, 490,000 subscribers on oh, YouTube. Oh, only, only, only. Yeah. I've got all these followers online. But... I'm not just saying this to big myself up or whatever, but just travel with me. Travel with me for a week anywhere in the world. And I promise you, the attention that I get sometimes, I have to pinch myself and think, am I a, am I a singer or am I an actor? Or um, who am I? Because I'm just, a, I'm just a normal kid from Birmingham who loved cars, made all these awesome videos that shared some of my greatest moments with people. And I've been with YouTubers with eight, nine million subscribers and no one even knew who they were. I remember seeing videos on Paul Wallace's channel, another guest of the podcast, someone that I grew up watching. Oh, where is he? You're in the white SV going through London, just ripping around. And I was thinking, how the hell is he getting away with it yeah. on camera? I, I, I don't know how I got away with it. That's my question. So as perfect as you can try and present yourself, and I understand you live with a lot of pride. You've got an awesome business, done very well. We'll talk about some of the things that you're currently doing and why you've got that flipping t-shirt on, yeah. which I want one of those as well. We'll get there. But everybody listening, everybody watching, every single person in their life makes mistakes and they learn from those mistakes. They try and hold to a certain value. They try and hold themselves to a certain point. We all make mistakes. One thing that I know that you've always lived off is trying to be as humble as you can possibly be. And I can see it through the business. But I am going to call out one moment. For sure. I and I know what it is, but carry on. It was a video with the police in Birmingham that went viral online. When you look back on that, is that still how you'd have held yourself now? Or was that a mistake moment? No way. No way would I do anything like that. Like even you mentioning that right now, this is like this is the problem with like media, you know, it, it sticks die. forever, you know, it doesn't <laughs> die. Tell Christian all about <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not a funny matter at the end of the day, uh, whether you're a police officer, whether you are a, you know, you work in the council doing the bins, whether you are, uh, you know, a CEO of a business, whatever you are, disrespect is disrespect. And um, I think God puts these moments in front of you for you to mess up and you acknowledge that you mess up. But at the same time, you have to make these mistakes to realize 
how bad these mistakes were. And my mistake, honestly, I don't care what people think of that video. If someone watches that and say, Aleem's this, that, the other, call me whatever you want watching that. It was it seven yourself. years ago, though. Yeah, to it's, put it's, perspective it's fine. on it. But forget them. It's how I feel watching that is what really matters. If I watch that video back and I say to myself that I find that fine, then there's a problem with me, isn't there? But from the moment that that happened and I watched it back, I cringed. And I was like, I'm not representing what my mother and my father or what my... Uh, my friends and all that sort of stuff around me expect of me or, or what they this is not this is so out of character of Aleem on that day I was on my high horse I was on cloud nine the SV roasters just arrived I've got like 12 cars following me I've got all these Birmingham hooligans around me pushing me to say something to the police officer because they see me as this young man who's in charge of the city he's driving around in his brand new you know, Lamborghini Aventador SV Roadster at the tender age of 23. You, Aleem, you say to the police officer what we love saying to him. And I said it. And I regret it ever since. And, you know, I've apologized many times to the police officer. He even came to the showroom. And, you know, he said to me, let this be a learning curve for, you know, yourself. Um, and, you know, he goes, I'll forgive you. And it wasn't even so much the forgiveness. It was more like, I'm glad it happened in a way. I'm glad it happened because... I think everything that happens shapes you for what you're going to become ahead of time. Now, look at my Bugatti, for example. Um, you know, that car gives you so much pride when driving it. You don't see anyone as anything. You know, at the end of the day, you're pulling up to someone and your alloy, one alloy wheel is worth their car. But if I had that mentality, it would just be a nightmare. That car wouldn't even be a blessing. It would just be a nightmare. I would be speaking to people disrespectfully. I wouldn't be earning rewards. You know my, my my good deeds. I would um, I I would I would just be a shit character, and nobody would like me. And I'm not doing it for people like me. Everything that I am today is all organic. It all comes from within. I hope you do feel that. But it is a very it's 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 a very tough question because nobody's actually raised this question in front of me for a while. Some people applaud me and they say, "Look, well done for what you said and stuff." I don't think I don't, I stay away from them people as well. So those are the type of people that actually push me. Uh, to do things that I shouldn't really be doing as well. I remember there was people there at the time as well that were encouraging me to say what I wanted and now they're no longer around uh, me as well because you've got to have good people around you. But all in all, if you have watched that video, again, once again, you know, I do want to remind you, I know it's seven, eight years old now, but always speak to people the way that you want to be spoken to. And if you haven't got anything nice to say, just don't say it. But we've all made mistakes, all of us, and we've all learned from them. And that's why I wanted to bring it up because there's no way that ev everybody from the outside sometimes looking in when they want to be someone, they want to get somewhere. Maybe they're listening to this podcast as inspiration for that moment to think, ah, that's what I was looking for, that bit there to help me on my journey. And people get knocked down the second something tough happens. So the reason I ask it, the reason I try and sit here and be like, right, I am going to do this is because I just want people to understand that it's not always easy. It's not always shit. No matter how high of a standard people hold themselves to, we all make mistakes 100% something that I am really fascinated though about is from working in a family business it's the best thing ever getting that additional time to spend with your father with your mother with whoever's involved in that business is golden and I know that probably more than most because I've actually I lost my dad so it's when you when you lose you look back and you think I was so lucky I might have only been 21 when he died but I was probably I could have been 35 and had the same amount of time with him, you know, because you spend time going to a builder's merchant or going to X, Y, and Z. And as good as our relationship was and people looked in, fuck me, Aleem, did we have some rows. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, when I say, when we, when, when something did happen, and I remember one that triggered the biggest one ever, which was just over stock control. I don't think we spoke for three weeks. I was that angry over this. But... Again, everybody from the outside would look and think, very well presented, well put together family business. You speak unbelievably high of your father. Your father clearly loves you a lot. We can tell that when you turn up at the showroom, wondering where you are, wanting to know, is he safe? Where's the car? You can see the love there. But there must have been some times that you two have tested each other working in close proximity. How's that relationship been, working and growing a family business with your dad? For sure. Um, there, has been, um, there has been some difficult days. And we look back at them, back at them, and we buzz off them a little bit. But um, 
it does get tough. Like a lot of people think that, oh, it's easy. You're working with your family. You've got to remember that, you know, if you've got a business partner or whatever, you know, you can, you can have a bit more of a say, but there's that respect factor as well with your parents. So you can't really talk to them in the way that you would talk to other people that were in the business or whatever. My father and I have had some, some huge arguments as well. Not like serious, serious, like I want to kill you, whatever. Nothing yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Nothing about ever about money. It's more so like Direction what color we should spec up a car, you know? <laughs> and it gets heated because like he'll want something a certain way or whatever. Um, what How we should spec up a car. Do we invest in four more Rolls Royces for the fleet or should we do something completely out there and buy a Veyron? Exactly. <laughs> Stuff like that. Um, but Alhamdulillah, as I've got older... And as he's trained me and molded me, I've become more of what he wants. So we'd have less arguments. You and your father, you were very young uh, when your father passed away. You were 21. Um, so he was probably going through that phase with you, right? Yeah, where he was molding you. You were having all your arguments. And then come 25, 26, 27, it does become a little bit easier because you know what ticks your dad off. You know what he wants. And you just start thinking like him as well. So you're just an extension of him. But... At the start, we did have uh, big arguments and all that, but now I know he is where he is today for a reason. He's the mastermind. He is the general. He is the man that created this business. So at the end of the day, all my opinions don't really matter when dad wants what he wants. And if he says to me, he looks at me and says, this is what we're going with, I will not raise a question. I will always say to him, well, why did you ask for my opinion then? If you don't want to take my opinion on board, why are you asking for my opinion? And stuff like that. So then he'll just make his own decision. But he really respects and loves everything that I bring to the table. And he doesn't hear me out. Um, it can be difficult having arguments at times, but we leave it all in the office when we go home. Do you know what's interesting there is that is sometimes tough for a character that's younger, especially when you've gone to university, you've learned a hell of a lot, taken a lot of information in, but you're also the one in the social media world bringing in a new type of client, learning a new type of thing that simply some of the older generation just were not exposed to. So you soak up more of that information. I used to butt my head against the wall with the whole board just over digital stuff. Now, the simplest stuff like digital stuff and end up coming to those kind of logheads. It's really annoying because sometimes you mentioned that the final decision is always with your father yeah. for argument's sake because you know and you respect his decision because of how long he's been doing it but I'm guessing when it comes to those things like which vehicle is the right vehicle for yeah. now or which vehicle would work best for the social audience or where are we taking this business exactly. digitally that's usually what causes for sure the greatest but, but because I've done such a good job with the with the business digitally that's all in my control he wouldn't know anything about it. This podcast that we'll do, he'll watch this back. He'll watch how I performed. He'll see what I said. He'll give me a little review, a little rating off of it. He'll check my Instagram out. He'll be like, right, great campaign that you did. He'll see the results, the customers, the clients that are coming through, the networking that I do. So the the more you achieve in front of his eyes, the more respect you will get. The, the, the more firm your seat is at the table, the more airtime you can have in speaking in front of him. But if you've got no credentials, if you're not really bringing much to the table and you're giving it loads, then you, you're, you're a nobody, are you? So when it comes to the digital side, the social media side, the YouTube, the marketing, me going into the yachting business now, why he is so confident in pumping all these millions into it is because he knows Inshallah, we are at that stage now where this boy has got a vision and he can execute it. He has got his phone book full of the right people and now's the time. This is what he wanted. He comes from the streets, you know, and he's got a son of his who's networking with billionaires all around the world, having dinners. They're on speed dial. They're like my friends, you know. I'm introducing him to them. I'm taking what he knows about business, the business world that he's in, and taking him out of this city and introducing him to these big fish around the world. And they're buzzing off him. They're saying, where have you been all your life? It's because they never really knew how to network or connect. And I was that little little spark, that little match, that kind of, that bridge that brought them all together. But not only brought them together, but also taking their business game to a whole different level. My dad has some great ideas. He's worked hard all his life. He's done, the, you know, the wheeling and dealing, the car trading. The, he's done it the hard way. Now he's got a few pounds. You know, it's time to take that, time to, like, as a risk taker he is, it's time to take the big risks now. And, um, and they're really going to, inshallah, propel us to the top. Whose decision was it to build the showroom behind? Who came up with the idea? Mine. Was it? Yeah. I thought that might be the case because I remember watching the drive absolutely full 
at your house. Yeah. And I remember one video in particular, I think it was 15 cars in the drive and it was the one at the back that you needed. Yeah. It was like the ghost with the goats plate yeah. on and it was right at the back. Has that been the right decision for the business, building this in the... It was one of the best decisions we ever made. Then um, We had like at one point 16, 17 cars on the driveway, as you remember. We were washing them on the driveway, rearranging them. It was great fun looking out the window. But what we had was a problem was where the site is at the moment, where the showroom is, was a uh, old Texaco petrol station. So the petrol station had, had disappeared. Uh, the tanks got filled with foam. All the uh, pumps got removed. So it was just the canopy the shop for the petrol station and a drive through and car wash at the back. My dad rented the car wash out um, to some locals around here. They were using the car wash. They had a team of six or seven and he was with us for about six, seven years the whole way through. And my dad's office was the shop, the Texaco shop. But the state that, that this was in, like the walls are damping them, like there's yeah, paint, yeah. Um, mold. yeah, mold, and um, the, 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 it's leaking, and uh, you know the tape. Everything was very, very basic because they were buying and selling cars, you know, buying and selling, buying from Birmingham car auctions, selling it, um, selling it on the forecourt, pot, you know, tidying them up, and they were doing well. They were selling twelve, fifteen, on a good week, twenty, thirty cars a week. You know, they were on fire, um, and then. When my, when my dad started the car rental company and we had we got three or four Rolls Royces on the driveway and I still don't, uh, because 2006 was the first Rolls Royce, 2007 was the second one, 2008 was the third one, 2009 was and the fourth one. And that is in one. a recession. Pardon? Yeah. but That was in a recession. Yeah. But business, okay, but business was absolutely on another level, like a one day hire on a, a one day hire on a Rolls Royce uh, Phantom was about, Two thousand pounds with a chauffeur. Now a one day hire with a Rolls Royce Phantom, that same Rolls Royce would be about six hundred pounds, seven hundred pounds, with, with, with that same model car. Obviously, with a new one, with a new extended okay. wheelbase Phantom Eight, would be about two grand. But the clientele at the time, because it was such a fresh business and it was no competition around it, the numbers were just incredible. So that that was a question I had. Why, in as summarised way as possible, why car rental rather than car sales? Okay. Um. As my father said, it was he goes, there's no better business than it. You know, um, it's difficult, sleepless nights, but once you get it right, it's just, you, you get to keep the car. It's a service, isn't it? Three days, someone takes the car. Five grand in your pocket. Uh, five grand's in my pocket. The experience has been done by the customer. He's happy as anything. He's not had to insure the car, not had to worry about tires, maintenance, storage of the car, anything like that. Just walks in, chooses the color car he wants, drives it, has his fun, puts some money in my pocket, and the car eventually comes back to me. However, from an outsider looking in, let's take a Hurricane Performante. Yeah. Let's say you've paid 240,000 quid for the car. Yeah. If that car ends up with 40,000 miles on it, and the knowledge maybe in the car was that it was owned by a rental company, that value of that car, it's going to lose money, especially. But I've already made the it. money back on the car. So, is that always the case with every purchase that's been made in the cars and the business that those cars are able to make the money back? Yes. On each one. Yeah. I mean, we've been in the business long enough to select the right cars. And also, it's all about risk assessment as well, risk management. I don't know if you've noticed, I've got less supercars in my fleet now, more 4x4s, four um, because the supercar side of things, it just gets a bit difficult at times. A lot of accidents, a lot of. You've heard about some of the bad stories. Yeah. My SVJ, where is it now? I think the first one I ever saw was the 458 Spider. Oh, white going one. to the wall? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone remembers that one. Yeah. Don't I, know what happened think, there, because the carbon ceramic breaks, aren't famous... they? Oh, get off of it. <laughs> it's not about stopping. It's about the speed that you're going when when it doesn't stop. What was, what did, what was Clarkson's famous line? It's not... It's not the it's, speed. Uh, yeah, it's not the speed that <laughs> will get you. Yeah. Suddenly stopping, that's Suddenly the stopping. problem. That's a, that is the problem. And I think he always wanted um, uh, cars to be assessed on their braking performance, not actually their speeding performance. But you see, like, incidents like that. I've had loads. I've had cars flip over. I've had cars go into walls. I've had cars catch fire. I've had cars on the side of the hard shoulder and the lorry's gone to the side of them and my clients have nearly died because they've got the hazards on. Lorry driver wasn't paying attention. I've had uh, engines catch fire on all sorts Your of... Your insurers some... must love you. Yeah, I don't, I don't actually claim off my insurance. For that stuff? What? Because otherwise you probably wouldn't get it. Oh, oh, we are one of maybe two or three, maybe probably the only car rental company in the whole country that has a 25 plus self-drive hire policy. 
Um, and the reason why we have that is because we're operating on such a big scale. It's very expensive. It don't Not everybody can get a policy like that. And uh, probably 90% of the car rental companies that um, our viewers here will probably go up to will be on a dodgy insurance. But I can't run like that because I've got eyes on me everywhere. Right. So you've had to foot the damage for every oh, time. Oh, yeah. I'm paying about half a million pound a year on insurance. Half a million a year yeah. on insurance. Just 75,000 is my Bugatti. And where is the Bugatti right now? That's in Dubai, right? No, the Bugatti's at HR Owen. Um, I'm having a 110 point check done on it uh, because I want to extend the warranty on the car. So it has to go through a 110 point check uh, where they check the car. Uh, make sure that there's anything that needs replacing or not replacing. Um, I've also had my steering wheel upgraded to a carbon steering wheel. So, yeah, it's at HRO at the moment. I was going to pick it up this weekend, but I just thought I'll wait for after Ramadan. What was the foundation behind purchasing that? Because you've mentioned the world that you got introduced to and you were surprised by when you got to university was a world that you hadn't seen before. You had your eyes opened to all of it. Mm -hmm. Many people have spoken about when you get into that higher echelon of vehicle like go from say the the people that can get themselves into sorry just, sorry the, just just before we go to that the question was about the showroom yeah yeah all right let me just finish this one off right here real quick so why we built the showroom was because the clients were coming to the showroom or to the existing showroom the shop they were booking three rolls royces and then we'd have to have a driver drive them to my driveway show them the cars because they were thought thinking it was a scam Right. Okay. Do you understand? Like you've got like you've got um, like five hundred pound to fifteen hundred pound, two thousand pound cars on the forecourt. We're wheeler dealers. We've just taken a booking for about three and a half thousand pounds. Chauffeur driven three Rolls Royces. Where are the cars? So you had to keep going back to the house. And my dad thought that was absolutely fine because it was like a wow factor. It's like you go from this to like a da da. The driver opens up and it's like yeah, we'll have more cars or whatever. I was like, Dad, we don't need that. We need to build a showroom. The reason why we need to build a showroom, everything's on standby. It's We're in a great location. It's marketing on the... On, 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 Literally when we were setting up the van mm. and I was outside just having a look at a few things, I reckon I saw at least 100 eyeballs just turn yeah. from buses, from everything. Exactly. And and it's 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 put it propelled us ahead of the game, ahead of the competitors by about 10 years. Nobody has still managed to replicate a showroom or do something like this in a, such a notable position in such a prominent location as well. Um you know, even the local car dealerships like Lamborghini, Rolls-Royce, McLaren, they all uh, give us credit for what we're doing here on the, on, on a main Coventry road, a main A45. We've got the Birmingham Airport 5 10 minutes away up there. We've got um, a massive um flow of traffic coming through it. So yeah, that's why we built the show. Sorry, going back to your question, my friend. No, no, no. And actually, before I even get to that question that I was going to ask, leading off the back of that, on the way up here, we actually spotted a pet number plated vehicle on the M40. But it wasn't one of mine. Would you not think? Oh, was it? It was a green Lamborghini oh, yeah. Urus. Oh, it was. So with a pet number plate. Has having, this is a bit of a weird question, this, has having the pet number plates been an advantage or a disadvantage, do you think? Very interesting question, that. Because... You'll have the people, you must have seen on Instagram, you might have even seen them in real life, I know you've been just a vibe and everywhere, that there's like a fake private jet set up somewhere and someone will get in, usually that's selling a Forex course on how to mine Bitcoining points or whatever mm -hmm, it is, mm -hmm. and they'll sit there in a Louis Vuitton bag in the plane, get the snap, done, sold a million things. Yeah. When you hire a supercar yeah. or any kind of car and then it's got a recognizable plate that that vehicle was hired it takes away the market of people that might actually be wanting to kind of pose with that car as their own do you see it as a benefit or a, um a well how they see it with a pet brand we're not cheap we are the best at what we do and it's quite dear to rent a car from us um we do provide the best cars the best service so people actually take pride in the fact that they've rented a car. If they're going to rent one, they're going to rent one from Pet. And they want it to be known that it's been rented from Pet. It's a brand. We do have a fleet of cars that have no Pet number plates on. That nobody really, uh, those cars are on long-term hire. Uh, so they will be gone for like months and months at a time. They're on rolling contracts. Nobody knows about these cars. The cars that you see here are just the Pet fleet. We do have a fleet of cars that have got no, you will never know that they're my cars. And they are for those clients that want to be a bit more uh, discreet and uh, um, but as for the pet branding, it's just an absolute magnificent stuff for us. Um, has anybody ever come up to me and said, uh, I want to rent this car for three or four days and I don't want the pet number plate on it because I want people to think that I own it? No. Nope. Um, they would rather go to someone and say, yeah, damn right, I'd give six grand a weekend for this car. Do you know? They'd rather say that.
and, I, and and the fact that they can change their car every weekend. You know, you've got to remember, there's people, there's, I remember Lamborghini themselves, the dealership, have rented cars from us. Lamborghini, I know it sounds confusing, Lamborghini, the dealership, rents cars from us when they wanted to give customers test drives or they want to convince them to buy a certain car. Like they never had an SVJ as a demonstrator. They hire an SVJ from me. They don't have a Lamborghini Urus S as a demonstrator. For argument's sake, they will rent it from me. I had no idea. Yeah, that that people was do that all on. the time. There's, there's millionaires, billionaires that want to be thinking of buying a Bugatti Chiron that can't have a test drive in the Bugatti Chiron. Will go and hire my car. So did you? Was the Chiron a purely business purchase, or was that something that you had to do? Was that something for you that you thought I've set myself a target, and no matter what, that's got to happen? That exactly that. <laughs> it's got to be. Yeah, <laughs> I wanted a Bugatti. That's what I wanted. I wanted a Bugatti, and uh, we were stuck on the Veyron for a long time. We were thinking, should we pull the trigger? Veyron, Veyron. My dad was about close to buying maybe two or three different Veyrons, and then he just went, you know what? You guys are like shit. Like, I'm gonna wait for the new one, and then the Chiron landed, and he was like. Mm. <laughs> he goes, that's all right, isn't it? I was like, Dow. first I thought it can't be a car better than the Veyron. And then when I saw the Chiron, I was like, wow, that is proper. Um, and then the rest was history. You know, we um, think my life changed from that day onwards. I actually have a cool story about Chiron, um, which will stick with me forever. One of the first Chirons that was ever delivered uh, into the country was delivered to a chap that's in Supercar Driver. I know, I've black been... car with the blue calipers. Yeah, blue interior. Yeah, That's it. Now that car, well, they, but, they yeah. once asked me to host a uh, drive out morning in Wales. When I was younger, I used to occasionally, if they had nobody to cover, like a little weekend drive or whatever, they were like, you know what, Ben, you're a good driver. We trust you. You can you can take on that 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 weekend and, and take the guys out if we've got no one to cover and do X, Y and Z from it. So I remember leading this drive through Wales. I must have only been about 19 at the time. Got the radio on, like a mic there, talking to guys behind, making sure there's nothing coming like... Uh, bikes pulling out or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Sheep. Uh, as well. And we got we got into the McDonald's the morning where people were going to meet at this McDonald's at Brecon Beacons. And they're like, they said to me, they're not sure what's coming on this one. We just kind of had the names register and no cars. And suddenly, Chiron. And it was right after they first, well, like it was one of the first ones into the car park. F12 TDF. F40 LM B1 Go for the red. I think so. I've got the I've got the photo yeah. running on it, and I remember we got up to the the gravel car park at the top of the Brecon Beacons, which looks over the top thing. I just went over and I said, "Ah, oh, you've got to take me out of that place." <laughs> and, I, and he just went, "Yeah, sure, hop in." What a uh, lovely fella. Off we did. We went down this road, and I will never forget. Just the, that's it. The constant acceleration. But this is the weirdest moment I've ever had in a car. And this is why the memory sticks with you. You wet yourself. <laughs> there is a place, and people can Google this when they call me out for saying this is bullshit. There is a place in Wales, and I know I've gone off on tangent here, but defies the laws of physics because gravity doesn't work properly. And an object, like a car, something heavy, will roll uphill. And it's something to do with magnetic fields or all the oh. rest of it. And it's on this road, and he knew about it. So we were suddenly like firing along in this show, and he goes, oh, wait, wait, wait. Hits the brake as hard as possible. And we stop in this, like, this dip. And it's like a cyclist going by. You can see him like, what the hell are they doing? You put it into neutral. And in a Bugatti Chiron that was taking all this stuff, we rolled uphill. And that that's why I remember it more than anything no, else. More the fact that rolling not... uphill in a Bugatti Chiron in Wales, one of the first in the country. With the that is owner. mega. That would have been a viral reel today. <laughs> <laughs> See, look at that. You're already looking at it from a digital perspective. No, but I, 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 I have heard about that place and it is very interesting. I'd love to see it, like physically actually witness it. But the first journey that you ever have in any Bugatti is magical. Like if they say their motto is, if it is comparable, it is no longer a Bugatti. I remember the first time I drove a Bugatti was on a test drive when I went to go order mine and I left my glasses in my mum's bag and I completely forgot that I hadn't got them on and then when I got onto the drive I didn't want to tell the test driver that I didn't have them in case it just turns into a long thing I have to go back and I'll go there I was just like let's just stick to it I'll be fine and for some reason because of the adrenaline that was pumping through my veins my eyesight just perfected itself I could suddenly see everything, and I've got a video of it. I drove the car, and when I was accelerating for the first time, my eyes just welled up. Like I just got teary eyes. I got blood rushing to my elbows. 
like I, I just got pins and needles. I went cold because I was like, shit. I'm going to have one of these in about eight to 12 months and I can drive it <laughs> however I want. <laughs> I was like, how am I going to sleep? This is not possible. And then the constant turbo whistling, the was like, oh my God, I've never experienced a characteristic of an engine like a W16. The base is enough to shake any building. That turbo wastegate, whatever you want to call it, I don't know the technical terms. That just sounds like as if Darth Vader was just about to come and kill kill someone. Like, you know, it's just it was just it was just absolutely mental. And then the comfort of the car was phenomenal. I've never I've never loved a car more than more than that car ever in my life. And I don't think I ever will. She's my baby for life. I know the answer to this already, but here we go. But where do you go from a Bugatti Chiron? Well, I asked myself the same question and then I found myself buying a boat. <laughs> <laughs> and not quite any boat. <laughs> I remember there's a very famous Irishman that likes to punch people that also has one of these. And yes. it was probably the first time that they were even properly put on the map. Yes. What I love about Lamborghini is the fact that they will come out and do something wicked. I remember when I first saw the green Ducati um, Lambo bikes. Yes. And, like that. and I'm just like, I'm Paul so Paul Wallace glad. bought one of them. Did he? Yeah. You learned how to ride a motorbike just so you could... I remember... I Why didn't you say that on the podcast, Paul? For God's sake, man. You're letting this man do your work for you. I've known Paul since he started YouTube. I don't know where he is in the world now. Paul, remember, I'm here still. <laughs> Lamborghini working with Technomar, which is part of the Italian Sea Group. It's a... Um, it's a uh, it's a shipyard, a boat manufacturer. Um, they're Italian, obviously the shipyard's Italian, and they got together and they designed a boat, which is a, such a unique um, vessel. You know, it's uh, 63 in foot. It's a f yacht. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a very fast yacht. It's a very fast, luxurious, carbon fiber piece of speed on Alcantara water. Alcantara goodness. Oh, goodness. Oh, and you know, as you can see, Colin McGregor being one of the first clients of um, of the boat was just magnificent. It was great marketing, great media for the yacht. Um, it actually, when I was looking for a yacht to buy, I didn't know what to, to get. I was thinking about is Sunseeker um, or um, you know something like a Princess or something because obviously they're made in the UK and uh, just really wasn't getting excited over them. And then when I saw the Lamborghini yacht, I was like, oh, of course, this is the one. And then when I saw the boat in person, I was like, oh my days. It's very easy saying 20 meters. It's very easy saying 63 foot. But when you see 63 foot in a Lamborghini design, from start to finish, you can see that Lamborghini DNA and it's sitting on water. It's like, how quickly can you become mine? The thing is just extreme, 63 knots, which is about 60 miles per hour on water, um, two V12 engines, 2,000 horsepower each, which is 4,000 horsepower in but total. It, 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 can can you? I say drive this. Can you? Are you gonna be? A, are you gonna be doing this? Oh, well, it's funny you ask me that because I just booked in my captain's license, so I'm training to be a, um, a boat captain um, in May. I'm going for a nine day, ten day crash course. So you call me Captain Aleem after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm only doing the course. Just change your socials for a week. Lord's gone. I'm now <laughs> Captain Aleem. It's not so much that um, I have to do it because I will have a, a, a more experienced uh, captain with the boat, but it's just nice to know. Um, you know, it's just nice to know. Oh, yeah, we, we've all seen Titanic. Yeah, you know, <laughs> mate. <laughs> well, I don't know what an ice uh, ice thing like that would do to a carbon fiber. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and the hole's not carbon fiber. It's actually uh, like, um, like a fiberglass, but there's components of it um, that are carbon fiber. So um, like the mast at the top, which I do remember cost me 275,000 euros and it was all in carbon fiber some parts of the hull um it's just a different game it's a different um it's a different industry that we're entering um we so want you're going to rent this out yes I'm going to be chartering this yacht in um Dubai I've all uh, okay this is an exclusive I've not all bought one I've bought two so <laughs> I've got one in Dubai and I'm going to have one in the south of France yeah I you didn't fancy Torquay Marina. I would. I am going to bring it to the UK for a marketing <laughs> stunt. I do want to. I do want to. Imagine as part pulling of in a, to Padstow Marina down in Cork. <laughs> That'd go viral. But what will go viral is having my Lamborghini Revuelto matching my Lamborghini yacht, and one's going down Sloane Street, and then there's a drone footage of one going down the Thames, and it's like from the road. To the sea. Da, 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 da. So, how do you transfer that into sales? 
What, how do I transfer a video like that into sales? Mm -hmm. Oh no, we've already got the sales rolling in. You're talking to a lean hedgy. <laughs> we don't have to wait for videos. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't mean to sound like a cunt. <laughs> but what, what, what it does is, um, so I go to my uh, database, people that have rented the Bugatti off me, people that have rented some of my high-end cars, people that have rented my Lamborghini Revuelto, and I just go to them and I say, look, well, if you're ever interested in hiring a, a renting a boat, never really thought about chartering a boat, are you doing one? Yeah, I've just bought a Lamborghini boat. No way, didn't even know it existed. Of course we want it. Boom, 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 book. Um, you know, birthday parties. Um, there's just all sorts happening with it. So, yeah, really, really It's excited. an interesting one, that, because in a world full of CGI, there's that guy, is it 2NCS on Instagram? He does the, like... He's based in Birmingham. He, he, he does the mock-ups, doesn't he, basically? Yes. Yeah, and all a good the rest friend of, of mine. It. And he's created some mad designs. It almost looks like that Lamborghini yacht, something that he would have done that isn't real, exactly. that people might genuinely have exactly. not bought because they don't think exactly. that it's real. And, and and Ben, this is what's interesting about um, myself entering the yachting world is that I'm bringing a recipe, a formula that I haven't really seen in the yachting world. And I'm not just saying that for myself because I'm just a, a student to the game. I'm new to, to the industry. I've only indulged myself into it for the last eight to 12 months, but I've learned a lot in that time. I've been invited to some of the best shipyards around the world, sat with some of the biggest people in the, in the boating industry, some CEOs of some big companies as well and that, that, that create boats. Don't want to mention any names. Um, but Manu Thiala, which is the guy that I bought the boat off, Royal Yacht International, even he looks at me and says, you know, I'm very confident in what you're about to do because you're about to bring uh, a new lease of life to this yachting game. The way that we're gonna create content, the type of people that we're gonna have on the boat, FPV drone shots, jet skis whizzing around the sides of them, you know, the great content packs, you've got prominent figures, you know, athletes that I know, all on, the, on speed, all gonna be on. The, the content that we're gonna be creating around this will be what we've basically done, the recipe that we've used for pet, to I'm go to the sea, the show, right? but people think that oh, you know, you just get nice drone shots of the of of a big yacht, and you put some nice music on the background of it, and you say charter now. No, no, no. We're gonna throw some impact into it. We're gonna show the experience. Sixty-three knots on water is no freaking joke. So Four point five million euros worth of boat. What does it cost to charter a boat like that? Um, between uh, depends on on how on the duration uh, but at the moment in the south of france they're charging around eighteen thousand euros 18 to twenty thousand euros a day a day 18 to 20 with all the fees fuel captain fees all the um hidden costs and everything all involved um you can also take it for two three hour charters um but yeah so it's about 22 20 to euros a day in the south of france in monaco and how many of them did they build 63 it was just 60. Yeah, 63. We're on hot. We're, 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 they're about uh, how, how two thirds of their way through the production. And when's yours coming again? Mine's coming in November, the first one. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen McGregor's still. See it pulling up at the Monaco. Bro, they I are went, just beyond anything. Ben, I went to the Dubai International Boat Show and uh, there were so many yachts there. There were some incredible sun seekers. There were some great uh, golf crafter majesties. Um, there were some very unique, cool boats. But I'm telling you, not there wasn't a Lamborghini boat there. But if the Lamborghini boat was there, it would take all the attention away from the boats. And I was thinking to myself at one point, have I paid too much for a 63-foot boat? Because for the same money, I can get something that's about 30, 32 meters, 33 meters in length with more bedrooms, more luxurious, and, you know, does the whole works. But it doesn't do 63 knots. So what you've got to remember is there's chase boats, there's yachts that go on charter for 1.5 million euros a week yeah some are going for 2 million euros a week some are going for 2.5 million euros a week now mr billionaire on his big 100 meter yacht can only go a certain speed but when he wants to go from monaco to capri on that boat it's going to take him a long time that's when you call up pet yachts da -da -da -da. can you send over the lamborghini yacht please to pick me up from my big flying fox this is a, a massive yacht. Sure. Why don't you take the chopper? Oh, no, the chopper my son's taken to Saint-Tropez. I'll take the yacht. We want to experience the Lamborghini boat. Gets the Lamborghini boat, takes it for a week as a chase boat. So it's just basically following the big yacht. And then whenever he wants to come off of it, he'll just use it as a tender. And he'll just use it to go from the big boat to the small boat to the port. Or if he wants to go from, let's say, Monaco to Saint-Tropez, Saint-Tropez to Cannes, quicker. It's the fastest boat, the most luxurious boat, the coolest boat to do it in. 
Could you have built that network without going to somewhere like Dubai? I didn't build this network from Dubai. I built all this network from <laughs> 1272 Coventry Road, Yardley, Birmingham, B Bravo 91, 1 Romeo, November. So did you believe old. that? If you could, if you, say you hadn't left the UK, so you hadn't have spent time out there, you still think you'd be able to find those clients and tap into them? Yeah. Um, D Dubai, like I said to you, Dubai is uh, somewhere that I've only been um, really focusing on business wise in the last 24 months. Before that, it all comes down to how you treat your clientele. The word of mouth, I mean, there's a lot of online marketing, all the marketing you can do in the world. But if you can't, if there's no output, if you don't say that what you can do, if you don't do what you say that you can do, then you're, all, you're just gonna, there's, there's nothing that's really gonna come off of it. Like I said, we're a team here from my staff, my father, to myself, to everyone from the guy that washes the cars, the guy that takes the sales. We really are a family bond and we do what it takes to make sure that the client comes first. The client has a puncher on the motorway 60 miles from here, it's his first day hiring a Rolls Royce Wraith or whatever, has a blowout. We're not going to leave him on the side of the road waiting for AA and all that sort of stuff. Boom, the boy's already, we've got spare tyres in the back there. Boy's already thrown the car like it's a fire brigade, thrown the tyre the, the into the car, bombing it down to him, gets to the client. Before you know it, client's back onto the road. If, worst case scenario, um, the client, we can't get him back on the road. We've got spare Rolls Royces. Might not be a Wraith, might be a Rolls Royce Dawn. Go there with the Rolls Royce Dawn, give him the key to the Dawn, say, you carry on with your journey, we'll handle the stress on this side, and once it's done, we'll deliver it back to your house and we'll swap it back over. You know when you start doing that for enough of the right people and they start to spread your network around and start recommending their family members and their business partners to you, your network just opens up. Nothing happened overnight. We started in 2006, we're now in 2024. This is 18 years of sleepless nights, blood, sweat, and tears. And what we are seeing right now is the fruits of all the hard work everybody's put in to pet to get it to where it's at, primarily my father. And it's very easy to sit back and be like, where's the success come from? Oh, wait, wait. Was it easy? You guys are smashing it. But Well, if I wasn't smashing it after 18 years, then bloody hell, I've not done a good job, have I? So I've got to, there is always a point in, in, in everyone's business where people will not understand what you've had to go through to get to that point. But would I have had the client base? Yes, I would have. All the, all, all, the, all, all the billionaire clients that I have, some that have hired cars from eight months, some that have hired it for a year, some that have got drivers for, I mean, I've got business happening everywhere. This has all come from a BlackBerry phone, a pen and a paper, and if you go into my dad's office, that's exactly how he does business. People come in, they meet him, giving that personal touch of an experience. It's all about the person. You know, when they speak to you over the phone and you've got a client flying in from, let's say, Canada and uh, they've got a wedding happening in Norway and they're stopping off here and they're like, oh, you know, we don't want to hire any cars in Norway. Uh, is there any way you could uh, ship some of your fleet over to Norway? Platinum never says no. Of course we can. Money's no problem to you, is it? No, not if we don't even talk about the money. We just say, how many cars do you want and where do you want them? I want four cars in Norway for my nephew's wedding. Right, what do you want? Two Cullinans, a Phantom 8, and uh, just send over a G-Wagon as well, whatever. Cool, put them on a truck or put drivers in it. Uh, how, how many days do you want it there in? Oh, I need it there in, uh, in 24 hours. I'm not going to go and phone a, 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 a truck company and be like, all oh, right, how long, how much is it? How long are you going to take to pull up? Are you going to do... Find four solid drivers, put them in the car, say, off you go to Norway, start driving now, go. And you've had that? <sighs> Too many times. Too many. I've, I've had cars go to Africa. But what happens when you get the wrong people? And how many out of 100 clients? Because you're business. people dealing with people. Yeah. So we're very good at like, you know, asking the right questions and smelling people out. Again, a lot of it is repetitive custom. A lot of it is people that vouch for another people. They were always recommended people. We do have new clients and new customers come on board. We do have certain requirements such as deposit, age. Uh, we do a little interview. We'll ask them who they are. We'll naturally just get it all out of them. Um, so risk management, risk assessment is very important. Um, obviously, my father's very good at what he does now being in the game so long. Um, but now and again, we do fuck up. And um, and we do give the cars to the wrong type of person, and uh, we, we we pay the price for it, you know. But I guess that's part of the business. I, I can't just sit here and it's saying that it's as easy as buying a car, renting it out, 
getting the money in, washing the car and giving it over to the next client. There's so much more behind it. There might be a car that comes back that was abused by the previous uh, client that's just chewed through uh, 3,000 pounds worth of tires in one hire. There, there might be a cigarette mark in the car that's burnt through the footwell. There might be, you know, he's curbed a wheel. It could be even worse. He's flipped the whole car over. And where do you draw the line? And have you ever stopped somebody getting in the car before? they've even taken it out for their first drive because you don't think they fit the bill. Uh, yeah, we have done that. Like maybe once or twice, like just seeing the person just come up to the car, recording it, and he gets in it and he just starts revving it in front of me on the on the driveway. And I'm like, okay, you give it a rev. It's cool. I know you want to rev it. I know you're going to do it behind my back as well. But you know when you're just going, you're like, mate, do you want to step out for a second? Yeah. Um, here's your money. Um, Here's your booking form, shredded. This is, there's your car. Just, should we just keep it on a good note? You take your car back, my car's not for you. What do you mean? It's my special day. No, it's not gonna be your special day because you're gonna kill yourself and you're gonna mess up my business. Or what's even worse is you'll end up killing someone else. So it's my responsibility. But we've got, obviously, we've got trackers on our cars and we've got uh, a risk management team upstairs that will monitor what roads they're on, what speeds they're doing, how much over, what violations they've done, harsh acceleration, harsh deceleration, um, you know, it's harsh braking, all that sort of stuff. So within reason, you know, we'll give them a phone call. We'll just top them up a little bit. We haven't got cameras or listening devices in the car. That's privacy for our clients. And then we'll just tell them, listen, just calm it down a little bit. Normally, after the first phone call, we'll never have any problems again. We have maybe a problem happen once every two years. Oh, wow. That's a lot less than I yeah. expected. But sometimes we have also had like three or four problems happen all in like literally three weeks, two weeks. And it's like... Where do you go from a Bugatti Chiron and a Lamborghini yacht? Um, what gives you the fizz at night? to go for the next thing so I, I still i mean when you say where do you go from a bugatti to a lama i've i've got a lot to do in the yachting world now so this is my new task this is a new challenge for me it's very easy to sit here and talk about it and say i want to do this i'm gonna do that I'm gonna do this. but now is the time that i put in that groundwork just imagine what platinum was in 2006 is what pet yachts is now in 2024 so we've got 18 years of some solid solid graft inshallah but when i look back on it I want to see a fleet of 25, 30 yachts, you know, worth a load of money. <laughs> well, when I'm next at the Monaco Grand Prix and I get to see them cars whizzing round, hopefully I'll be able to come up and knock you up to get onto the boats <laughs> yeah, somewhere sat sure, down next sure. to the track and have a flipping wicked experience. We're doing, we're doing this amazing podcast in the back of your van. I think the next one, part two, should be on, on the back of the Lamborghini yacht. Let's make it happen. Yeah. Aleem, you've been a fantastic guest. It's been amazing to hear your story, everything that's gone into doing the business with you and your father. And I've been enjoyed how I've been able to relate to a lot of that earliest days as well. So thank you for coming on to Road to Success. Thank you so much and for I coming over the to best Platinum. Of hey, and by the way, guys, make sure you subscribe, share and like this video and show all your support. This is one of the most incredible podcast setups, most enjoyable podcast I've done. And uh, you know, I had an idea of doing a podcast in a van, but my idea remained an idea and this man went and did it. So make sure you show him some support. Right, Thanks guys? Thanks very much, brother. You're welcome.